Last week, we addressed this being a new day and a new season in the life of the church. And indeed, across the world, in all of the chaos, we're definitely facing new days. We also talked about how Jesus said we would be known by the way that we loved one another. So as we lead into Easter and the greatest act of love ever shown to our world, let's check in and ask the deeply personal and reflective question, how's your love life? In one or two words, I'd like you to think how you can describe love that has vitality. For contrast, maybe also think about how you'd describe a love that is tired. Tired doesn't mean old in the same way as vital doesn't mean young, although sometimes it may seem that way. Okay, let's park those thoughts for a moment. So what do we believe about love? We know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This is the great introduction for many to the Christian story. That God is love, and in and through that love, God gave us Jesus, the man that would be our redeemer. And so I want to challenge you. If you are a follower of Jesus, then this great redeeming agape love is reciprocal. 1 John 4 says, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that God, that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The sheer enormity of this act of love should challenge us and cause us to examine ourselves. Have a good hard look. Have I become mechanical in my Christianity? Have I gone stale? Have I taken God's grace for granted? Have I become complacent? Have I forgotten where I've come from and the one who redeemed me from my otherwise helpless state? So the question is, how's your love life? And for all those brave enough to take this journey with me over the next 20 minutes, I think you might just find out. For those of us who have grown up in the faith or have been Christians longer than some of us have been alive, we need to recapture, revitalize, renew and re-engage. We need to rediscover the God who is love together. Not through some mechanical religious formula, not through some pious ritual, and not through some romantic music and firelight or long walks on the beach. We need to rediscover the love of God through discovering and rediscovering his purposes. Our text in Revelation paints a picture of love gone astray. Let's read that together. It's on the screen. Revelations 2, 1 to 7. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear that the, what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Here we see in full colour a love that has gone astray. 
This is common in almost every area of life. In marriage, some people wake up after one, five, seven, 10, 20, 30 years and find that love has left. Our jobs, careers, once challenging and exciting, can become boring, mundane and habitual. Any pursuit once started can lose its vitality. Just ask anyone who has five or 10 years on you. We need to guard against this happening. And no, it's not by making a love management plan, but we do have to make a choice. The sobering fact is that this can happen with the things of God. Our text illustrates a picture of a church, a faith community born in great revival with a great love for Jesus, obedience to the call of God. They were light to the world. They were the salt of the earth. They did not contain their faith to the four walls of the church building for one hour on a Sunday. Our text shows us the consequences of the slow erosion of purpose and mission. Why do we worship God in soul? Why are we encouraged to witness the love of God to the unchurched? Why do we do the things we talk continually about doing? Listen to Jesus' words in another part of the New Testament. He makes an awesome and somewhat terrifying statement. When he comes to judge, there will be people that say, Lord, Lord, in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. This brings a frightening and sobering reality that you and I can be involved in religious activity, even religious activity that has a supernatural and miraculous element and still miss the will of God. In our text, Jesus is not putting the Ephesian believers down. He is not condemning them, but he is wanting to bring restoration, renewal and rebirth. Our challenge from this text is to recognize the possibility of this happening. Take steps to maintain our first love because many things strive for our affections. We need to make clear choices in the arena of our first love. So let's settle the issue of our first love. If we are going to claim the salvation of God, if we are going to profess Christianity, if we are going to declare Jesus as Lord of our lives, we need to determine what is our first love. Everybody, without an exception, has a first love. That which we love the most, give our time and talent to, give our money to and our resources to. That one thing that has won over the affections of our heart. That which we love supremely above all things. Some people have some pretty good first loves. A wife or girlfriend, clearly not at the same time. A husband or boyfriend, again, not at the same time. Children, sometimes job, career, business, your vocation. Maybe less good, your car or new phone, Candy Crush or YouTube, or maybe it might even be you. You're totally into yourself. The truth of the matter is there is only one acceptable first love for a believer. There is only one thing that must vie for our affections, our time, our talent, our money, our resources, and our love. Salvation is not simply recognizing Jesus as Lord and Savior. True conversion results in a change of affection from whatever was your first love to Jesus being your first love. This is the picture of conversion, a change of affection. It cannot be bought. It cannot be bargained for. It is born out of the miracle of salvation. We love him because he first loved 
us. My Bible tells me that Jesus works on our behalf. It is Jesus that shows us mercy first and foremost. It is Jesus that offers us forgiveness first and foremost. It is Jesus that gives us absolution and a new life. All this while we were undeserving sinners. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Romans 5. One commentator put it this way. The natural response out of all this is to give him, to give Jesus first place. His reward is our affection. First love must be maintained. If we are not mindful, it can deteriorate, drift away, become stale. And all we are left with is a hollow shell of actions and meaningless religious ritual that is in itself completely unfulfilled. So the important question, how do we keep from losing our first love? Firstly, it's in the choices we make. We a choice born out of a right attitude and a right heart. I choose to love Jesus above all else and will do whatever is necessary to maintain a right relationship with him. David declares in Psalms 18.1, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. Our need is to develop and maintain an appetite for holy things. Like newborn babies craves pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. 1 Peter 2, 2. The Apostle Peter is declaring to us that we need to exploit an appetite for the life of God. As if our mortal life depended on it, we need to crave it, yearn for the life of God, hunger after the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But because the truth is, first love once obtained can be left behind along the way. Many times without realising, we can do all the right things, going to church, reading the Bible, financially supporting the church, involved in ministry, yet still our first love can fade and be forgotten. Our text in Revelations chapter 2 paints a picture of a church born in revival, a church born in extraordinary circumstances, not unlike this church. A group of believers who feverishly labored for the cause of Christ. They did many things right. Jesus' words ring out, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Note, they left their first love. It was not lost. Jesus emphatically declares they left the position of love. The message virgin says, but you walked away from your first love. Why? It's a process of slow erosion, a deliberate move. They cooperated with this process, all the while not realizing the seriousness of what was taking place in their midst. The frightening fact is that this can happen to us as individual believers as well as a church. It is possible in the midst of our salvation to develop an indifference towards the things of God. Please listen to me. Whatever we do should be done out of a pure motive because there is a love and desire to please him who first loved us. When we were unlovable and didn't deserve it, because nothing else will do. In Matthew 15, it says that Jesus talks about this as a lost passion. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. This is an awesome and terrifying thought to get so used to things of God to get so used to the presence of God, doing the right things in the eyes of men. But really, we are indifferent to Jesus. It can devolve into a works mentality. 
somehow we can get it into our head that doing the right things and good works alone are pleasing to God. Luke 10, 38 to 42, Jesus touches on this with the two sisters, Martha and Mary. In verse 40, Martha was distracted with much serving. She demanded that Jesus take notice of her sister Mary's negligence. Jesus declares to Martha in verses 41 to 42, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. In Matthew 23, Jesus turns up the heat and nails the Pharisees and scribes for this same religious works mentality. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others under. Heavy, heavy words spoken to professional religious men. Hypocrite. A person who professes beliefs and opinions that he does not hold. An actor playing a part. A pretender. You pretenders. You religious pretenders. You follow the letter of the law and give 10% from your vegetable gardens, but where is your first love? Unchecked, unchallenged, we can develop this same or similar mentality. A subtle pride creeps in and says, I'm doing enough. What I'm doing is great. We look at the scribes and Pharisees and say, yes, Jesus really slammed those religious devils. But just stop striving. Just stop expanding your horizons. Just say, why should I do more? I'm doing enough. Then, who's Jesus talking to then? 2 Corinthians 5 says, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. The Apostle Paul is saying the love of Christ should compel us to press on into the riches of God, to the fullness of a life in God. Paul's life is a testament to a life sold out for Jesus, a life that took hold and grasped opportunities to expand the kingdom of God. Like him, we need to seize, grasp the opportunities of God in our lives like babies craving spiritual milk, the scripture said. We must be honest and open with ourselves and with God. So the question is, do we still have the enthusiasm we used to? Do we still have that love for Jesus? God says in Jeremiah 2, I remember the devotion of your youth, how as a bride you loved me and followed me through the desert through a land not sown. Is the honeymoon over? Is the honeymoon over? God is saying, I remember your love for me. I recall your passion. You would walk across a hot desert to get to me. But is the honeymoon over? Jesus is asking, asking this morning, how's your love life? Can I tell you? With Jesus, the honeymoon is never over. It's eternal. Never be complacent with Jesus. Never lose that honeymoon experience, that freshness, that just saved experience. We need to recover and rediscover our first love. And this is a daily process. There are many practical ways to keep first love alive. Daily devotions and prayer Thanking God for our salvation. Thanking Jesus for dying for you, taking your place. Something had gone wrong in the Ephesus church. In our text, Jesus is crying out to them to make a return journey. Jesus highlights three truths involved in making the return journey to rediscovering the life of God, recovering your first love and recapturing the honeymoon. 
Jesus tells us that we need to remember. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Luke 15, Jesus tells the parable of the prodigal or wasteful son. In verse 17, it says, Then when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. He remembered where he came from and returned to his father. Do you remember from where you have fallen? Do you remember how lost you were before God found you? Do you remember the confusion? Do you remember the depravity of your mind? Do you remember the mess that Jesus pulled you from? The mercy that God showed you and how Jesus changed your life? The human condition has a tendency to become complacent over a period of time. We forget the great things that God has done in our lives. We become indifferent to the things of God. We can even get angry at God himself. Jesus declares that discovering and rediscovering the life of God involves being mindful, cognizant and remembering. Jesus tells us we need to recognize we are in need and go about the business of change. What we're talking about is the fundamental need to repent. Verse 5, it's saying, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Understanding and recognizing the issue of change is critical to maintaining a repentant attitude, a pure heart, and the will to keep your heart's affections on course. Jesus tells us we need to re-motivate, re-engage ourselves, revitalize your faith, reinvigorate your passion. Do the first works. In other words, do the things you did at first. There is a certain quality to the labor and love of a brand new Christian. There is a glow, there is a shine. There is a freshness. Church, that quality, that spirit doesn't have to wane. Vitality is not about new versus old. It doesn't have to fade. It doesn't have to go away. As I close, this is a call to action. For some, it will be discovering the life of Jesus. For others, it will be rediscovering the life of Jesus. Maintaining a first love keeps everything in life in proper balance. Obedience to a holy life and the call of God. All are of no avail. All are of no value if Jesus is not your first love. So the big question I repeat is how is your love life? Before we pray and conclude, I would like us all to reflect and meditate on these things because we are people that all need a saviour. Every one of us, you and I. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot offer anything to redeem our souls. There is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. We need Jesus. He alone is the sure foundation. He alone can save us from our sins. He alone can give us new life that is truly life, that is eternal. He alone can mend a broken heart. And he alone can cleanse the stain of guilt from our lives. And so I want to challenge the person who is here right now And you recognize that your heart has grown cold towards the things of God. Your heart has backslidden. Your life has turned back. You have left your first love behind. The good news is that the Bible says that God is married to the backslider. God wants to restore you. God wants to bring you back to your rightful place. Or perhaps this morning you are a person that has been challenged by the Holy Spirit into a greater and deeper relationship with Jesus. 
And this morning, your heart's desire is to rededicate your love and passion. Perhaps the Holy Spirit has resharpened your focus this morning. Whoever you are and however you've arrived in this gathering, I want us to take this moment to recapture and rededicate our first love. As we worship together and share communion at the Lord's table, so let this be your prayer in whatever state God wants you. Heavenly Father, we recognise that we need you. We recognise, Lord, that you have created the greatest act of love to bring us back into relationship with you. Lord, we pray we do not take that for granted. Lord, we pray we turn our hearts to you. Open our hearts to be made and moulded by you. That we might rediscover and engage in our first love in the way we first did. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come and to think and to focus on the things of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.